I was, uh, I really like that song that we just, the last song that we sang together, because it kind of plays into what I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, you know, it said, though I may be humble, may my, make, uh, help my will to crumble. Now, I was thinking, if that song were written today, it would probably be, help me not to crumble, wouldn't it? That, was, that song was written quite a long time ago, and they had the right attitude. My will needs to crumble because my will is the thing that's getting in the way most of the time. And this has been our problem all along. I'm, I'm doing a Bible study right now, and um, it's on basically sort of worldview. And it's kind of based on this verse from Romans 12, 2. And I'll wait till it comes up. Well, maybe I won't. Romans 12, 2, though, if you've got your Bible. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is something the Lord starts in us when we're born again. The very first thing He has to do after He gives us a new spirit is to renew our minds because our minds are already messed up. And they get further messed up as we live our life in our culture, in our world. We get away from what the Lord really wants from us. The only way to renew our minds is, of course, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, confess our sins and be saved, then to study the written word and allow the indwelling Holy Spirit to teach us. He's our teacher. Our minds are corrupted by virtue of the sin nature and what we've learned in life because our filter basically is off. It's not filtering properly. And I gave an illustration of a uh, filter uh, to our Micronesian folks and talked about straining, a, stra straining coconut to make coconut milk. You have to grate it up and then you strain it, you press it into this sieve and it comes out coconut milk, on, not coconut juice, coconut milk on the other side. You guys know that. Well, you know, if you use like a one-inch screen to do that process, you're not going to get real coconut milk. You're going to get everything passing right through. Uh, even if you used a quarter-inch screen, the same thing would happen. Uh, you have to use a fine screen in order to separate the milk from the leftover. Well, you know what? That's what we need to know what's going on in this world. Our filters are off. And the very first thing that God begins to do is correct our worldview. Because you know what? If your worldview's off, you won't understand God's reality. That's the problem we have today. People's worldviews are off. I like the word world worldview, even though it's kind of a technical term, but it's got the whole thing right there in the word your view of the world. If you're not viewing the world as God views it, uh-oh! We need to learn to see things from God's perspective. And that's something we have to learn because we're not born with it. <laughs> and as we go through life, our filters get further and further off. So that's why I started this study uh, that I'm doing now sort of on bigger issues by going back to an original problem. And that original problem is found in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12, believe it or not. This is actually talking about the Antichrist. But it says, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. That's a problem we have today. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. And so that all uh, will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Now this verse in various translations can also be translated. They will believe falsehood or what is false. 
But most of the translations actually say they will believe the lie. Ooh, this has always been an interesting passage to me. What is the lie that's talked about in verse uh, 9 and also in verse 11? What are the, are the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing? Deceives. And how long has this been going on? Or does it only happen at the coming of the lawless one? In what way does the lie cause those who do not believe the truth to delight in wickedness? Those are questions I want to answer briefly. But does anybody know? Do you have any idea what the lie is? Anybody know what that is? The lie? What's that? Well, that's part of it. Well, let me put it this way. Who came up with this lie to begin with? Ah. And what was that lie? The I'm not talking about a whole bunch of lies he told Adam and Eve. I'm talking about the big one. I always call it the big lie. Which one was that? He wanted to be like God. You will be like God. Woo! That's what Satan came up with. And by the way, he came up with that long before Adam and Eve. He came up with it in the third heaven. Well, to briefly answer these questions, the lie of Genesis 3.5, we will look at that in a moment. But I, I believe that if this verse were only specifically talking about the lie that the Antichrist tells, which he tells the same lie, he says, I'm God, then it probably would have been said like this, they will believe his lie. But instead it says, they will believe the lie. Notice that the passage said, says, wickedness deceives those who are perishing and not those who will perish. So apparently it's going on already under the rule of the Antichrist. So apparently the lie has been affecting mankind for a long time because the, per the phrase, are perishing, is present tense. And this was written by Paul, guided by the Holy Spirit. Also, the fact that the lie causes men to delight in wickedness also seems to indicate that this is not simply talking about the time of the Antichrist, but all those who believe the lie and do not believe the truth. Uh-oh. We've been caught in a lie, haven't we? And this lie has affected every aspect of life. That's why I want you to think about this. Because once you grab onto this and you begin to see how this affects everything, it will change radically change your worldview. Now, there have been many varying interpretations of this passage, and I looked at a bunch of them in the commentators, and basically, I agree with all of them. They all have a point. Um, John Gill focuses on, uh, this is pointing toward basically the Pope, <laughs> the Vicar of Christ, supposedly, who's basically summing up what the Antichrist is going to be all about, and I think he's right about that one. Anybody who claims to be Christ... Some state more generically that those who reject the truth are rejecting who Christ is. That's absolutely true. J.B. Phillips says that the lie is that the Antichrist claims to be God. Yes, absolutely. It's part of it anyway. Matthew Henry says it's a rejection of the gospel of grace with parallels to the passage on blasphemy, which is Matthew 12, 31, where Hen Henry actually claims that the rejection of grace is what constitutes blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I think he's certainly partly right on that. Matthew Poole names a number of lies that this could be talking about, such as lying wonders, false doctrines, false prophecies, idols, as constituting this lie. But And I think all of those are good explanations, and they're all true. However, I think we have to even step back one more step to see what constitutes this lie. I've come to the conclusion that the lie, the lie, is a root cause, not a symptom like we're seeing in those explanations. So where can we find out what this lie is? Well, of course, we have to go back to Genesis 3, 5. The devil says, Leviathan says, for God knows 
that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. In the Genesis account, we know that the serpent lied to Eve, and then she and Adam decided to disobey God. But the enticement was not so much the sight of the fruit, which would be the lust of the eyes, or the taste of the fruit, the lust of the flesh, but it was especially this false notion that they could be like God, which is the pride of life. And that knowledge of good, at the knowledge of good, which they already knew, by the way, they already knew good. He lied to them. Oh, you'll know good and evil. Well, they already knew God. good. Guess what they got? <laughs> they got evil. Wow, and what a price they paid. The pride of life temptation of Satan has always been the strongest appeal to the free will of man. All of those other things, they always lead up to the pride of life. That's where he can get you. If you think that you're in the place of God, that's where he can get you. The devil uh, also tempted Jesus with these three areas, as we've studied before. And I'm going to list them out of order just so that I can make a point with it. Of course, the lust of the flesh temptation that Satan always uses uh, corresponds to Matthew 4, 1 through 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I, I fasted for two weeks, and I was very hungry. Okay? The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. By the way, every one of his answers is from Deuteronomy. That's Deuteronomy 8.3 8, that he quoted. And, you know, he didn't fall for this. He was very hungry. But he told Satan that man doesn't just live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then he... Then he went. Uh, then later he went for the lust of the eyes, which was uh, uh, Matthew four eight through eleven. Again, the de devil took him onto a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Lust of the eyes appeal to the lust of the eyes. See all those kingdoms of the world. Was Satan lying to him? No. <laughs> well, partly. <laughs> half truth, half lies is what he always does. The truth of it is, yes, he has temporarily been given the kingdoms of this world. Something to consider, folks. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against... Yeah. Always remember that. Don't be sucked in by these people who are going to kill Satan and bind Satan and take over the world. No, they're not. There's only one person who can do that. <laughs> it's Jesus when he returns and he throws Satan in the abyss. Let's never forget that. But I love how Jesus answers from Scripture. He's giving us an example. That's how we are to do spiritual warfare as well. And that answer is from Deuteronomy 6.13. Well, finally, I wanted to deal with the pride of life temptation. Matthew 4, 5 through 7 then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he says. Satan says to God, can you imagine this? He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. That's Psalm 91, 11, and 12. Jesus answered him, it's also written, do not put your Lord, the God, your God, to the test. Deuteronomy 6, 16. Now, even though Jesus could have done any of those things and ordered Satan directly to hell, could have done that. Or he could have snapped his fingers and Satan would have been out of existence. Since Jesus holds everything together, I, I like what you said. What would happen if he's not reigning? <laughs> uh, my answer is, <laughs> you're done. 
But he didn't do that, did he? He answered the enemy as an example for us from the written word each time. Notice after the first temptation where the devil appealed to the lust of the flesh, since Jesus was very hungry and having been answered from Scripture, Satan then changes his tactic and misuses Scripture as his second temptation uh, toward the pride of life. After, he, um, after he's again rebuffed from the written word, um, uh, you know, he goes back to attempting to tempt Jesus on the basis of what he has been allowed to have, that is, temporary dominion over the kingdom of the world. By the way, yes, he has dominion. No, he could not give it back to Jesus. God gave it to him. Who does, who does he think he is? I can give you all the, world, all the nations. No, he can't. But you know what? This set of temptations was used to seduce Adam and Eve first. And in that case, in obeying God, in disobeying God, it resulted in sin being brought into the world. What a sad day. I was thinking about it the other day. And in the millennial kingdom, the lion will lay down with the lamb. It ain't happening now. Lions eat those kind of things. That's an effect of sin in the world. You don't think nature has been affected by sin as well? Yes, it has. So though these three temptations were all part of, Adam, the, of why Adam and Eve fell, the pride of life temptation was the one, I believe, which sent it over the top. Hmm, good fruit. Mm, probably tastes good, but oh, we could be like God. I can see it. That's how human beings are. We all want to be little gods. Look at the shaman through history. Look at these guys going, and you're going to go backwards. That is the pride of life. It is wanting to be like God. Take the place of God. Ooh, they could be like God. How tempting. You know, when you look at what I like to call the big lie, that man can be like God, you can quickly see this is a driving force behind virtually all the deception and lies today, especially in our generation, because this is a big thing now. Societies and churches are full of the big lie. Many people today have fully bought into the big lie, and I believe that God is allowing this to happen to those who do not believe and do not remain in the gospel and remain faithful to Jesus Christ. I hate to tell you this. There's a point at which he gives people over. Man, I don't want to see that. Do you? That's scary. But I believe I'm seeing it happening. Furthermore, the longer people disobey God in this, the closer they get to God giving them over to this lie, which always means that there's no salvation left for that person. You know, I've never seen the big lie invade so much of the consciousness of people as I have today. And you know what? I'm old enough to remember a time when this was not the case. Some of us are old enough to remember. We'd seen these people on TV saying, I'm God. I'm, I'm, I'm the Messiah. In my day, <laughs> take them. Take them out. <laughs> Get the hook. Not now. You can basically start with a postmodernism as a basis for everything that this lie touches. The new idea of, you know, this new idea of postmodernism, which is really a very old one, is what drives most of society today. This lie goes back to the times of the judges we, we read in the Bible. And before that, where the Bible says that every man did what was right in his own eyes. But today it's morphed into a straight-ahead belief that man is evolving toward godhood, and in fact, people have now become gods unto themselves. You ever heard these people always saying that this one little phrase when something good happens? Oh, my God. And I always think to myself, which God are you talking about? Are you talking about yourself? I think a lot of times they are. They're just kind of doing a rhetorical statement to themselves. Well, this is all evidenced in society's lack of the fear of God, in placing its own judgments above God's written word. 
And let me give you some examples. When you look at the homosexual debate, you can see quite clearly that people think that they know better than God. When it comes to a difference between the written word of God and opinions and consensus of these new liberal egotists in our culture, we can see clearly who wins and who loses the hearts of men. Oh, well, don't say anything. <laughs> oh, really? You mean I can't say what God said? I can't remind you that uh, maybe you ought to be looking up because maybe brimstone is going to come down on your head? You guys know what I'm talking about. That's why Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. How quickly people forget. This goes, goes over into issues such as sexual immorality, environmentalism, planetary sustain, sustainability. I always love that one. I heard that one today on TV. We're, we're going for planetary sustainability. Oh, I see. You're going to sustain the planet, are you? Really? You're going to pick up your trash and go green and sustain the planet? I don't think so. You don't have enough. <laughs> You don't have enough wisdom or power or anything to do that. I'm not saying it's not good to take care of the planet. I'm just saying don't boast about it. Oh, we're going to save the planet. Oh, really? And global warming, which is now planet, what is it? It's climate change. <laughs> I, I really love this, you know. It's like I, I, I'm, not, I'm not making fun of it because I think it's a cool thing. But, you know, that boat, that 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 boat that's going to sail from Hawaii all over the world. I think it's really cool. But they were talking today about how everything on that boat is a, a very, almost zero carbon uh, footprint. Zero car carbon footprint on this boat. And then I'm going, but the ocean is the biggest <laughs> source of carbon dioxide on this planet. It far out, out does any kind of industry we have or cars or anything else. And yet, well, we're being, we're being careful to save the planet here. It's just so hypocritical to me. And, of course, we have the demented idea that most liberals and of most real liberals that humans can create a utopia on Earth. We're going to make a perfect society. Oh, boy. I don't want these guys making a perfect society. They have messed it up so bad, it's going to only take Jesus Christ himself coming back to set it right. We have messed this sucker up, folks. Really bad. We need help. We've got judges who rule not on the basis of the written word, as they used to. Did you know judges used to use the Bible? No, they don't even look at it. In fact, they, th they throw it out. But now they do it on the basis of their own ideas. Oh, my ideas are so much better. And if it conflicts with the Bible, then my ideas are better. Legislators pass laws from their own sensibilities and ideologies instead of hearkening to the will of the people. They do this all the time. They even do it on this island, I'm sorry to say. It's, it's, it's sad, man. What do we elect these people to do? But they're doing their own thing. Why? Because they know better. They know better than you and me. We're just the stupid people. Leaders of many nations enact laws from, for their own benefit to enrich themselves instead of being humble servants in the positions God has put them in. Sorry to say. And there are many examples of that. What happened to all that money, by the way? Schools teach children to have high esteem and change the history books to glorify people from the past who really actually weren't true heroes, but they fit into their sense of political correctness. That's more important, to be politically correct than to actually give people the real history of what happened. Oh boy, and that brings up another sore subject. They teach sex education to very young children to the consternation and alarm of some parents. One example, of that here in Hawaii is this new Pono Choices. In elementary schools even. It's a sex education curriculum. And uh, I was listening to a radio show and they were talking about it. And the guy said that he found out that 
Basically, what they teach is that there are three legitimate human relationship alternatives, homosexual, lesbian, and heterosexual. Homosexual came first. That's how they teach it. As one recent report stated, teachers in Hawaii in the public schools are to give these three alternatives, but to state that the least desirable alternative is heterosexual marriage. I have this document at home. It's unbelievable, folks. So this one lady who had a kid in the class went up to the teacher and said, can't you give a positive uh, example, any positive examples of heterosexual marriage? And he said, no, I can't do that. If I do that, if I go against the curriculum, I'll, I'll be kicked out, I'll lose my job. So I have to do it the way it's written down. All this to say, they've replaced God's will and God's plan and the very thing that can help the human race with this garbage. Rights and freedoms are being systematically taken away by governments and by leaders who believe that they are the anointed ones. The ones who are somehow in their own minds further along on the evolutionary scale toward godhood. And thereby can and should make decisions for those who are not so evolved. Oh, we're the unevolved people. They're the ones who have evolved to a higher state. And they're moving toward godhood. Television shows glorify all kinds of immoral behavior based on erroneous, an, an erroneous understanding of freedom, claiming that personal decisions are neutral and don't really hurt anybody else. Oh, that's my personal decision. That doesn't hurt anybody else. Oh, really? We do live in a society, and things that we do do have consequences, and affect other people. Postmodernism, subjectivism, and relativism have the motto that truth can be different from person to person, and each person needs to be careful not to judge the others based on his or her truth. That's the, that is the definition of the society we live in. Oh, it can be different for you, and different for me. My truth is different from your truth. That they're all truth. The notion that we can create our own reality has been picked up by the media, obviously, and popularized by celebrity talk show hosts such as Oprah Winfrey. She's a big one. Uh, I'm not saying that literally. I'm saying she's a big promoter of this. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> of this idea. The notion, uh, you know, th and this all comes from New Age, New Thought, School, uh, of people like Norman Vincent Peale and Robert Schuller. They're very much behind all this idea. And also from the parallel root, which is word of faith root, which is also influenced by New Thought and New Age. And it's people like Essex Kenyon and Kenneth Hagin, Dad Hagin. People just thought, oh, Dad Hagin's so great. Oh, really? He's teaching everybody to be little gods. That's, that's his whole deal. In our time, the messages of word, word, faith, word of Faith have come through people like Kenneth Hagin, I mean Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, Joel Osteen, and many other TV evangelists. Oh, just think positive thoughts and say positive things. Don't say something negative, because that karma, boy, that'll come right back and get you. That's what it is, isn't it? It's karma. It's Eastern mysticism. I was listening to the guy, I was listening to Joel Osteen the other day. Within one minute, he's already talking about that. Don't say a negative thing. Say a positive thing. Well, what about if you're a sinner <laughs> in need of a Savior, and if you don't get saved, you're going to hell. Oh! <gasps> now I'm going to have negative things happen to me. So you know what? This deluded idea was first invented by the devil himself while he was in heaven. Think about it. He was denying true reality in favor of his own manufactured reality. I will, he says. 
I will be like the Most High. What happened? Well, he got worshipped all right by a third of the angels, and they all got thrown off, thrown down to the ground. You know what? This whole thing has become the norm, not only in society, but also in many churches. I hate to say it. While in the past the idea that a person could create their own reality by speaking positive thoughts was laughable, today it's become part and parcel of the society that we live in. Robert Tilton says, just speak a new Cadillac into your driveway. Marilyn Hickey says, just look at your wallet and say, wallet, you wallet, big fat wallet full of money. I command you to be full of money. You know? Does that work? In my day, that would have been grounds for the people in the little white coats to come and take you away to the rubber room. But now, people are actually believing it. Oh, yes. That's what I do all the time. This is off the point, but I always laugh at these guys on these television shows, especially on the cooking shows. Because some of them are humble people, but other ones are like, they've obviously listened to these people. And they're in there, I'm the best person in the world. I'm the greatest cook. Nobody can beat me. I'm going to beat everybody. You know what? They almost always lose, <laughs> which always cracks me up. I'm like, see, it doesn't work, does it? But now when uh, televangelists promise their followers that they, all they need to do is send some money to them and their positive action will result in great piles of cash coming back to their giver, these dopes actually believe it. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, here. I have people send me money sometimes. They probably do it to Mike, too. I, I, get, I get letters to, like, Benny Hinn <laughs> and Kenneth Copeland. And lately, it's been Reinhard Bonnke for some reason. I don't know why. But people will send me money. And I send the check right back to them. I say, lucky I sent it back to you, because otherwise you'd be out. If you send it to them, you get another letter asking for more. Well, you know what? This is because postmodernism mixed with Eastern mysticism has brainwashed most of us. We grew up in this society. That's what I'm saying. We have to have our minds renewed. But it all actually goes back to the big lie. More and more people, though they may not recognize it in themselves, are buying into the perception that they truly are little gods. Benny Hinn claimed numerous times on, on TBN that he was a little God, a little Messiah walking around. I'm just like Jesus Christ. He urged his followers at one crusade, I have it on video somewhere, and he's getting him to chant, I am, I am. Uh, Mike knows this. If you were in Israel and you started doing that, <laughs> you'd be taken out back and stoned. Them serious words, man. Joel Osteen regularly and insistently preaches that positive thoughts and confessions bring positive results in people's lives, whereas negative thoughts and confessions will bring about negative consequences. Many people who have bought into the Word of Faith, New Apostolic, Emergent Church, and other movements that teach this stuff have had their lives ruined by these ideas. I, mean, I hate to tell you this, I have lots of emails from people who have just been killed. Their faith has been decimated by that kind of garbage. Because it's not biblical. It's not how the Lord works. I'm a firm believer in what the Bible says about the fact that there's a time and a place for everything. I won't read the whole passage, but a time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance, etc. There's a time and place for everything. We're not supposed to be all happy-go-lucky. You know, just, uh, what's, this, what's the song? Be happy? Don't worry, be happy. <sighs> uh, if somebody's mourning, and I think about this lady that came tonight and wasn't able to come, she was mourning. We prayed with her. But, you know, sometimes you've got to mourn with people. So there's a time and a place for everything, a time to laugh, a time to mourn. Time to embrace, time to refrain from embracing. We're not created in order to only have positive thoughts. 
We're certainly not created with the ability to create something out of nothing. That's called ex nihilo. That's what God does. And by the way, he's the only one that does that. Oh, we can create things out of something. We can make a clay pot. We can make electronic things. But we have to start with something to make something else. We don't go, there's a car, you know. Only, only God can do that. And that's Colossians 1.16 and Hebrews 11.3 in particular. Flip those up. Anyone who knows the truth about who God is understands that it is God who creates rea reality from nothing, not man. Therefore, man cannot be possibly be God. We can't possibly be God. Who are we kidding? Though God has given mankind a spirit as a reflection of himself, because he is spirit and a free will, we do not have his powers. We're not omniscient. We're not omnipotent. How, how, how can people fool themselves into that? But they have. We love to think about that. Those who no longer have the fear of God, or perhaps never did, will find themselves facing God someday and having to answer for the assumption that they know better than God. Oh, I know better than God. I would never send people to hell. I think homosexuality is just fine. I think all these things are just fine. That's what I think. And that's what makes it important. Because I'm basically a little god unto myself. And what I think counts. You know, anytime people do that and go against what God is saying, they're making themselves into a little god. This is the problem with our whole society. It's people who are living in rebellion against God and putting themselves in the place of God. The egotism of many people is astounding to me these days. When you really think about this, how much the big lie has affected our lives and how quickly we fall into it. I want power over other people. It's a dangerous trap, folks. Be careful of it. Uh, maybe we should be singing the song, though, though I may be humble, help my will to crumble. I will, that's what Satan said. That's the fighting words of Satan. I will ascend. I will do this. Don't fall into his trap, man. That's a big how can people possibly think that their little minds and values match those of God? We don't know. We don't know what's up. I'm glad that someday we will know everything. God says we, when we see him face to face, we will know him like he knows us. Wow, I'm looking forward to that. Because a lot of questions will be answered. But until then, you've got to trust him. You know, are is this stuff on the cards really true? He is greater than I? Well, of course, I always think, what he are they talking about? I think it's kind of a generic thing that, unless you explain it, it's not real helpful. But is it really true? Is he really greater than I? Are his, his thoughts greater than my thoughts? Is his love greater than my love? Whoa. What amazes me even more is that Christians who ought to know better actually think that they can create things they want in their lives through their thoughts and actions. What a lie of Satan this thing is that's going on today. It's all over. It's all through the churches on this island. I'm sorry to say. I don't want to see it that way, but that's what's going on. Oh, I just want to go to Inspire Church so I can be inspired, you know. They're going to inspire me over there. Whereas that church, ooh, Bob's church, he like tells it like it is. I, I don't want to hear that. I'd rather go to Inspire Church. You know what that church, it's, it's, it's John Bevere. It's his church. It's a word of faith denomination. 
that he came up with. And he was the associate pastor of Benny Hinn. That's where he got all his ideas from. I mean, he was standing there in his church, apparently, when supposedly Jesus Christ appeared on the wall, and he was there for weeks. His shadow was on the wall. Kind of like one of those, you know, Mary in a, <laughs> in a cookie or something thing, you know. <laughs> wow, what a miracle. Come on. Beware of people like that, man. Don't be around them. Get away from them and tell people to get away from them because they're dangerous. They're carrying around dangerous things. Oh, yeah, they can say some nice things, but in comes the heresy. They're always laying error alongside of truth. Look what Satan does. He did it to Adam and Eve in the garden. He laid some truth down, but he also laid some of the most damnable lies ever that screwed up the entire human race. Well, you know what? This idea that you can create with your thoughts and actions is actually a direct denial of the gospel message where we learn the reality that we're all sinners and we do not match up to the glory of God. We have to recognize that in order to be saved. Otherwise, why would we need God? If I'm God, why do I need God? It's a substitute for God. But apparently many people have forgotten this and they actually do think that they're already physically glorified now. This comes from the manifest sons of God as well as other false doctrinal systems. <laughs> Those guys actually believe and teach that we're going to be glorified while we're still alive and uh, we will be uh, uh, eternal. We'll have eternal, our eternal bodies. I mean, I, I think they watch too many uh, Highlander episodes. You know what I'm saying? They're off, man. That's not going to happen until Jesus comes back and we're resurrected or we go to meet him in the air. They're not going to be living here and then all of a sudden I'm turning, oh, out of my way. I, I'm a mortal. I don't know about you. Oh, brother. Of course, those who are truly born again are guaranteed glorification as the hope of the coming glory that we have in Jesus Christ. That's Romans 8.30. But just because Jesus ransomed us from the clutches of sin and the devil and death and justified us, is sanctifying us, and will glorify us, does not make us little gods now. Well, yeah, you can be a son of God. You can be a child of God. You can be his bride. You can be involved with his body, the church. But you yourself are not Christ. Beware of that idea. But that's all through word of faith. It's all through it. It illustrates to us the big lie of the devil, which has never been the truth, nor will it ever be. Now, I have an article that you might want to read. It's, in fact, it's also a DVD on my site called, uh, a video on my site called Satan Was the po First Postmodernist. And it talks more about Satan's rebellion in heaven and how he came up with the idea of postmodernism long before man did. Satan actually thought that he needed to be worshipped as God was, wor was worshipped and willingly forgetting that he was a created being. Oops, I forgot. Well, God created me at some point. I am not self-existent, eternal. I'm a created thing. There, ergo, <laughs> you would think the logic would kick in. And I'm not trying to be funny about it. I'm just telling you that's what happened. And I don't get it. The Bible says that men have also deliberately forgotten God. 2 Peter 3.5 says, But they deliberately forgot that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. People deliberately forget what they don't want to accept. They don't love the truth. 
it's getting increasingly hard to witness to people and to help them to come out of cults and false churches. And Mike will attest to this because people don't love the truth. They won't even read an article. We had someone here who sent out Jacob Prash's video. And the guy wrote back and said, I only watched 10 minutes of it. And that was it. I was done. I don't like it. He needs to stop doing that. This is the attitude of people, though, today, you know? They don't want to actually consider the truth and think about it because they're afraid that it might change their point of view. I don't want to think about the flood. Well, now we got this big flood movie, which is a total garbage, new age garbage. And so they make a story. They make a fable out of it so people won't actually believe it. People don't want to believe it because if they believe it, they got to understand that there is a God and God does judge. <laughs> hmm. Completely ruins the entire evolution debate. That one thing. Well, amazingly, Lucifer, or actually he's not called Lucifer technically. He's called an angel of light, basically. But he did this while he was in the third heaven in the presence of God. So I guess it's not beyond the bounds of imagination to understand that men and women can, in the presence of God's intricately created world, which is ample evidence of him, believe the big lie. They were all little gods. This is one of the things that's behind the false notions of people, false worldview. It's the thing that's gummed up our filter so that we can't see what God really wants for us. How do we fix that? Well, we don't fix that. God fixes it. But we've got to be students of this. If you're not a student of this, you're going to be just flowing around not knowing what you're doing. We have to use this in concert with the teaching of our precious Holy Spirit to be able to understand what's going on in this world. Because this is God's world. This is God's truth. Truth is not relative. Truth is God's truth. And we've got to find out what it is. And believe it and help other people with it.